worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Savior, there are 
10,000 charms Thirsty, come in, welcome. God's free bounty, glorify to belief and to repentance. Every grace that brings you nigh. Well, I will arise and go to Jesus, He will embrace me in His arms. In the arms, my dear Savior, who oh, there are ten thousand If you tarry till you're better, you will never come at all. Now we arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms. In the arms of my dear Savior, there are ten thousand charms. I will arise, I will arise and go to Jesus, he will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of my dear Savior, oh, there are ten thousand charms, oh there are ten thousand charms, oh there are Ten thousand charms. Hey, good morning, Indy Metro. I hope that you all had a wonderful Christmas that you were able to celebrate. Uh, safely with your loved ones and your family. I, I hope that you're able to all participate in what I challenged us to do on Christmas Eve and just have an extended time of prayer, uh, offering to God the things that you are thankful for for the year 2020. Hey, I would actually love to hear about those stories, those, those times of prayer that you had. Uh, if you're comfortable sharing with me uh, what God revealed or what he did uh, during your time of prayer uh, on Christmas, I would love if you could email me. I'll put my email address uh, down here on the screen so that uh, you can get a hold of me. Just, just let me know in what ways God showed up, that what way God communed with you as you were uh, praying as a family on Christmas Day. I personally one of the things I thanked God for during my time of prayer was, in a weird way, completely messing up my personal rhythms uh, this past year to, to an extent that I had to take two giant steps back and sort of just reevaluate things. I had to redefine what the absolute most important things in my life were, and then I had to reassemble new rhythms so that I could better pursue those things. It was a good refocusing and a recentering. Now, admittedly, I, I, have, I have struggled doing this. I've not been quick to change. I, I've had moments of, of just laziness and despair along the way, knowing I should do certain things differently, but still struggling to do it. I felt overwhelmed. I've struggled to make progress. But I'm thankful that in the midst of all the tearing down that the Lord has been doing in my life, that, that he is undoubtedly at work in, in patiently walking with me as things are getting built back up. See, in light of this, using Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14 is our scripture this morning. As, as we're heading into this new year, that's really the focus for this morning. That, that's what I want our focus to be as we're approaching this new year. I want to challenge us to make 2021 
a year of rebuilding and refocusing on our discipleship, of consciously joining with the Lord in the rebuilding and the reorganizing that He is certainly doing in our lives right now, both as individuals and as a collective whole as a church. If 2020 was a year of tearing down, then let's strive to make 2020, 2021 a year of partnering with God to build back up. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I, I invite you to start turning with me to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. From his prison cell, the Apostle Paul wrote this. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let, let's pray together. So Father, we're grateful for another day, another year on this earth. We're grateful for um, your undeniable presence in our lives. God, we, we pray for the focus and the energy and the, and the discipline to join you in what you're doing in our lives, both as individuals and as a church in this coming year. God, bless us so that we can bless others. It's in your name we pray, God. Amen. The Apostle Paul writes, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. When it comes to refocusing and rebuilding, here's where you and I need to start, right? Why? Why did Christ Jesus take hold of me? Why did he take hold of you? Why did he do it? And what purpose did that create in my life? In the message version of the Bible, John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 says this. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his, his son, his one and only son, and this is why. This is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it is. He came to help to put the world right again. So why did Christ Jesus take hold of me? Why did he take hold of you? Out of love, out of a never-ending, never-giving-up, eternal love. He wanted to set the world right again. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Christ, Christ Jesus took hold of me because of love, but he also created within me that same type of love. He, he not only did it, he not only loved me and, and saved me and took hold of me for, for a reason uh, that describes who God is, but he also did it for a reason of creating within me a new purpose. Again, turning to the Message Bible in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, we read, You are the ones chosen by God, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. And Christ Jesus took hold of me because he loves me. And Christ Jesus took hold of me to create within me the same type of love. I press on towards having a Christ-like type of love in my life. I press on towards becoming more and more like Jesus where the fruit of who I am is showing unbelievable and never-ending love for God and for other people, regardless of the situation I find myself in. This, my friends, is the subject of the refocusing and the rebuilding that God is doing in our lives right now. It's through these difficult times that God is accomplishing something in us that we, never, we, we may never have the opportunity to be accomplished again. This isn't a season to, to weather the storm, to just keep our head down and make it through. It's a season to join with God in the unique ways that He is allowing us to spiritually grow right now. So the question becomes, how do we do this? How? How do we join with God in this refocusing and this rebuilding? How do we foster spiritual growth in this difficult season? Well, thankfully, the Apostle Paul in our text today highlights five ways that we do this. He writes, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken a hold of it. But one thing I do, 
Forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So to spiritually grow in this season, here are five things that we can do. First, we start with an honest assessment. Second, we simplify the possibilities. Third, we stop living in the past. Fourth, we strongly pursue a disciplined life. And five, we set our sights on the kingdom. So with that as a backdrop, let's take a look at each one of these one at a time. First, let's start with an honest assessment. Start with an honest assessment. The Apostle Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. One of the difficulties that the Apostle Paul continually found himself battling were were these false teachers who would come in to the churches where he planted, and they, they would plant this idea in these churches that, that you had to follow certain rules for God to accept you. Things like circumcision circumcision and other Jewish traditions. They would plant these ideas, sort of like if you want God to accept you, then you have to perfect yourself in some ways first. That you, you don't have access to the perfection that God offers if you don't perfect yourself. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. See, Paul, he starts with an honest assessment of himself. He knew that he still had plenty of growing to do. He knew that he had not perfected himself, nor could he. He knew that he still struggled with weakness on an everyday basis. Romans chapter 7, verses 22 through 25, the apostle Paul writes, I love God's law with all my heart, but there's another power within me that's at war with my mind. The power makes me a slave to the sin that's still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Who will free me from this life that's dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Right, Paul, he, he knew that he wasn't able to perfect himself. He needed Christ, and he would always need Christ to do that. See, so for our own spiritual growth in the year 2021, we, we too have to start with an honest assessment. As a church, we, we are completely out of rhythm when it comes to our typical discipleship activities and expressions. As a church, in many ways, we haven't been able to act like ourselves. On top of this, as individuals, we feel isolated and disconnected. We don't know when all this is going to end. We're on fumes. We're trying our best to remain optimistic, especially for for those people in our lives we feel responsible for. We have to start with an honest assessment that things are not ideal right now when it comes to feeling connected, when it comes to growing. We need to acknowledge the unique challenges that we find ourselves in. Otherwise, we we might revert back to this this idea that we, we demand perfection out of ourselves before we can approach God. See, friends, it's okay to struggle. It's okay to feel weak. It's okay to miss the discipleship expressions that we've excelled at as a church in the past. It's okay if that's where you're at. But what it's not okay is to allow these things to prevent us from taking advantage of the unique ways that God is allowing us to grow in this season. We start with an honest assessment. When it comes to our spiritual growth, we need God now more than ever. Secondly, to grow spiritually in this season, we simplify the possibilities. The Apostle Paul says, but one thing I do. One thing I do. See, this is where I think New Year's resolutions actually are a bit helpful. right? There's all kinds of things that we wish were different in our world, in our lives, in our, in our relationships, in our church. So where, where do we even begin? Where do we begin? In Luke chapter 10, verses 41 through 42, as Jesus was in her home and Martha, she's freaking out about all the stuff that needs to get done. We hear Jesus saying this, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is necessary. See, when we're overwhelmed with life, it can can be helpful to simplify the possibilities and to focus our movement in a defined direction, right? But one thing I do, Later on, I'm going to define this direction for us as a church for the year 2021. I'm going to make a New Year's resolution for Indy Metro, and I'm going to invite you to join me in a focused pursuit of the Lord in the upcoming year in this, in this defined way. Indy Metro, you are, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is necessary, to grow, especially during a challenging time. The only thing that's necessary is to grow. Simplify the possibilities. 
Third, for the sake of our spiritual growth, we stop living in the past. Right, Paul says, forgetting what is behind. Now, forgetting doesn't mean that we blot out the memory of everything that's ever happened to us before, right? Paul, throughout the epistles himself, he appeals uh, to his upbringing uh, as, as a Pharisee, as a Jew. Paul, he, he recalls all the times that God has showed up in his life and saved him from shipwrecks and, and from exposure and being stoned. Uh, Paul talks about uh, all, all, uh, his, his conversion experience on the Damascus Road, right? Forgetting what's behind doesn't mean we have spiritual amnesia. It means we let go of the things that aren't helping us to move forward, right? For the sake of our spiritual growth, we forget the bad. We forget the bad. We let go of our failures during 2020, things that we wish we, we, would, we would have done differently, decisions that we, that we could have made better. We admit that we could have been better parents or a better friend. We admit that, that we wasted time and resources on multiple occasions. We learn from our failures, and we move forward. Likewise, we, we forget our sins of the past year. We confess them to God, we confess them to others, and we move on. We know that we've acted wickedly and rebelliously. We acknowledge that there are many times that we didn't love, we didn't love well, and, and that we were selfish, and we only thought about what we wanted. Through the grace of Jesus, we approach our lives today without the shackles of yesterday's sins. We forget about the hurts and the disappointments that we experienced at the hands of other people in 2020. For the sake of our own spiritual growth, we forgive. We forgive. We refuse to live in the past by becoming bitter or by harboring a grudge. Instead, we move forward, right? Forgetting what is behind. We let go of the bad, but we also let go of the good. You and I, we, we got plenty of things right in 2020, right? We hit it out of the park when it comes to, to our professional lives in some ways. We loved other people extraordinarily well when they needed it the most. We were generous and we were patient. We bit our tongues on multiple occasions when we could have been mean. We stood against injustice and hatred. But we don't allow these things that we excelled at to be the reason that we kick back and take it easy moving forward. We don't allow the things that we've done in the past to excuse us from excelling at loving other people in the future. We recall the things that we've done. We recall all the things that happened to us in 2020. We celebrate them. We mourn them. We learn from them and we move on. We stop living in the past. Well, fourth, for the sake of our spiritual growth, we strongly pursue a disciplined life. Paul says, straining towards what is ahead, I press on. The words in Greek for straining and pressing on that Paul's using here is really an athletic term. It, uh, the picture that it paints is, is, a, is a sprinter at the end of a race giving it everything they got, that wringing out every last bit of energy in them, leaning forward when they get to the finish line, all in the hopes of winning the race. It's a picture of a self-disciplined life when, when the ultimate goal influences daily decisions. See, Paul's really saying how we train ourselves spiritually should resemble that of how an, an Olympic athlete trains themselves physically. And to this end, as I alluded to earlier, here's what I'd like each of us to commit to in the year 2021 when it comes to our, to our spiritual disciplines, when it comes to our walk with Christ. In the, in the midst of this continued season of pandemic, limiting our usual discipleship expressions as a church, because it can be so easy to fall into rhythms or just getting by of, of surviving instead of thriving. These are the things that I want us to set our sights on to excel at in 2021. Hey, if you're a regular attender of Indie Metro, uh, what you're about to see, uh, a hard copy is also gonna be mailed home to you so that you can, you can use that for your own planning and participation purposes as well. So first, in 2021, I want us to commit to a regular time of prayer and intercession for at least five days a week. I want us all to make a plan for what we or for how we are going to pray in 2021. What does your prayer life look like in 2021? Make a plan and then prioritize keeping this rhythm faithfully. Secondly, I want us to commit to a regular time of engaging scripture, whether that's meditating or memorizing or studying it, for at least five days a week. I want us to define what it looks like for us to prioritize God's word, make a plan, and stick to it. 
Third, I want us to commit to a regular time of serving and befriending the poor or marginalized in our society. This can be done in all kinds of ways, right? You can serve with an organization like Ball 46201 or Unconditional or Elevate Indy or 91 Place. Or you can become a licensed foster parent. You can help a student academically. You, you can simply come alongside a struggling neighbor or, or someone else in your life. Fourth, I want us to commit to a plan of financially contributing to the mission of Indy Metro Church and at least one other gospel-oriented organization. There are plenty of like-minded nonprofits in our city and beyond. Love Guatemala, Outreach, The Lynn House, Serve Life, Unconditional, Elevate. Let, let's commit to helping those who are on the front lines of offering hope and relief. Fifth, commit to meeting at least once a week, virtually or physically, with a one-on-one discipleship partner or with a smaller group of Christ followers for community and accountability. Just like Elevate Indy says, no one gets there alone. We need each other, especially in these times of ongoing isolation and disconnect. Six, commit to participating virtually or physically in the Sunday morning gathering. Seventh, commit to taking at least one spiritual retreat in 2021 where you can have focused time with God. And finally, commit to a rhythm of fasting from something during the 2021 Lenten season. Pastor Jake will share more information as as Lent approaches on what this is going to look like for our church. So the question becomes, in this upcoming year, are we going to survive or are we going to thrive? In 2021, for the sake of spiritual growth, let's strongly pursue a disciplined life. Let's strain towards what's ahead and let's press on. Lastly, to facilitate our spiritual growth in this season, we set our sights on the kingdom. Right? Paul says, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Right? The, the, the goal that Paul is talking about is the kingdom of God expanding both within his own life and the life of those around him. That's the goal, to see God's kingdom expanding. He wanted more and more people to understand the goodness and the glory of God. He wanted himself to live more into the truth of who Christ Jesus really is. This is the picture that Paul kept at the front of his mind. This is the picture that motivated his steadfastness and his perseverance in the face of struggle. This was the gold medal that motivated his spiritual disciplines. And remember, Paul, he's in prison as he was writing these words. Like us in this season, he wasn't a stranger to feeling overwhelmed or or confused. He understood even better than we do what it means to suffer for the kingdom. He knew the temptation of wanting to get things back to normal as quickly as possible. He he had to, to know what it felt like to have periods of life where he's just weathering the storm and trying to survive. But more than all these things, what, what motivated Paul was the hope of what was to come. I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So friends, as we're entering 2021, what is the prize that you're you're seeking? What is your goal? Is it similar to Paul's? Or is it to weather the storm, to survive, to, to get things back to normal? Back in March, at the very beginning of all this, I said that that we have found ourselves in the middle of a rare opportunity that that we'll never have again to display the the good news of Jesus Christ to other people. And to your credit, you responded. You responded with overwhelming love, generosity, and grace. You gave away thousands of pounds of food. You helped pay the rent and bills for other people struggling to make ends meet. You created environments virtually and physically for those who were lonely and needed a friend. You interceded in prayer for those who were struggling and feeling hopeless. You didn't ignore the problems that were unfolding all all around us in the world, but you engaged with the issues of reconciliation and justice. In 2020, you responded with gospel love, to your credit. But now, if you're anything like me, because there's no end in sight of this pandemic, what you're feeling now is just tired and worn out. See, I still believe that we have a rare opportunity, one that we will never have again, to draw near to God, to learn about the gospel, to be transformed more and more into the image of Jesus. This season, in a strange way, has provided us with a weariness that maybe we've never experienced. It's provided us with the context to really understand what Jesus meant when he said, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. So church, that's my focus, and that's my invitation as we approach 2021. 
Let's commit with each other to these rhythms of discipleship, faithfully coming to Jesus in a season of weariness, in a season of needing rest. Let's come to him expectantly. In these challenging times, let's refuse to simply survive, and instead, let's choose to thrive. Will you commit with me to these eight areas of discipleship focus for the year 2021? I hope you will. Let's pray. So, Heavenly Father, we come to you now uh, acknowledging our need for you and your great love for us. So, God, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ. And God, in a strange way, thank you for this season where you can highlight things that maybe we've never realized about you before. Help us not to squander the opportunities that you give us, but help us to excel in pursuing you. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Pastor Jake here again. Um, As always, we are going to close this morning's worship by taking the Lord's Supper together. So take the next minute, go to your kitchen, grab something to eat or drink. Um, in listening to, to Pastor Jared's sermon this morning, um, I was reminded of this passage from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, verse 28 through 29, where Jesus says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus' posture here is so different um, from what we see in in much of the culture at large that holds grudges, uh, shuns forgiveness, and judges harshly. But our Savior says that when we are weighed down by the brokenness of the world and the sin in our own lives, He is waiting there not as a slave driver or a taskmaster or an angry parent. He's there humble and gentle at heart to offer us true rest because he is better. So for the next few minutes, um, just sit and and take in and read these words of Jesus. They'll be um, up on the screen in a moment. Take time to rest in him this morning and uh, eat and drink of the elements um, over the next few minutes as you feel led. Guess what? I am doing the lesson from, does anybody maybe recognize the background? I'm doing the lesson from the preschool room today. Thought we would just do a little change of scenery and you could see your classroom. It's still here. I know we haven't been in the rooms for quite a while. Um, But anyway, I hope you all had a Merry Christmas. I hope you enjoyed spending time with your family. I hope you took time to just Um, either read through the Bible or talk about or pray, whatever it is that you do as a family, but just the reason um, that we get to celebrate the awesome day of Christmas, right? Which is Jesus being born. Amazing. So I sure hope you had a great time. 
And it's actually, I was thinking about, that's really our big picture question, right? Does anybody remember what that big picture question, why was Jesus born? We celebrated Christmas because of Jesus being born, right? Yeah, he was born to rescue us. Jesus was born to rescue us. That's the big picture question. So we talked about, I'm just going to kind of recap, this is our last um, lesson in December and then we'll move on to something else starting in January. Um, first week talked about the prophets telling God's big plan, right, which was Jesus being born to rescue us. Then we talked about um, the angels appearing to Mary and Joseph and telling them what was going to happen, that Mary was going to give birth to Jesus. Then last Sunday, we got to talk about um, Jesus being born, that God sent Jesus um, for us, right? This week, we're going to talk about um, the wise men. Do you remember in the, in, the, in the Bible, it talks about the three wise men, right? That they go to visit um, baby Jesus after he was born in the manger. And that is what we're going to do today. What we're going to talk about today is the wise men visiting Jesus. It's out of Matthew 2, so you can look that up, okay? I want to just kind of read it to you because um, it was... It's a lot of information, a lot of stuff in this lesson, so um, I'm just going to kind of do that, okay? Long ago, God promised to send a king to save his people from their enemies, which we talked about, right? The people waited a long time for their king, and the time had finally come. God's son, Jesus, was born in Bethlehem. So that's what they're talking about, because remember the prophets told about Jesus being born long, 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 long before it actually happened. So that's what they're saying here. At this time, Herod was the king over the land of Judea. Was Herod, was Herod the God, the king, was Herod the king that God promised? Nope. Herod was, he wasn't a good king. So he's not who God promised. Some wise men saw a star in the sky. It was a sign that Jesus had been born, so the wise men went to go find Jesus. They came to King Herod. Remember, he wasn't a, he wasn't a nice king. Where is the king of the Jews, they asked. We saw a star in the east. We want to worship the new king. King Herod was very angry because he wants to be the king, right? A new king? Herod was king. He asked the priest and scribe, scribes, where is this king that was born? So he's like, um, not happy because there's another king. I'm the one that's supposed to be the king and nobody else. So they're telling him he's in Bethlehem, just as the prophet said. His priests and scribes like told him that, like the new king was born in Bethlehem. This is what the prophet said. This is what happened. Herod spoke to the wise men in secret. So the three wise men that had just asked him this question, he's whispering to them. Go find this child. When you find him, come tell me where he is so I can worship him as king too. Now, do you think we just talked about um, Herod not being a very nice king? Do you think he truly wanted to go worship the new king, Jesus? Because he's the one that wanted to be king. No, he did not. He was lying. He didn't want to worship him. Do you know what he wanted to do? He wanted to kill him. He was not a nice king. The wise men followed the star to Jesus. They went into the house where Jesus was with his mother, Mary. The wise men fell to their knees and worshiped Jesus. Then they gave Jesus gifts. Do you remember what the gifts were? Three, there were, do you remember? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When it was time for the wise men to go home, God warned them in a dream not to tell Herod where Jesus was. So they took a different way home. So God knew what was happening. And remember, God's plan was to send Jesus to rescue us from our sins. So he did not want that to happen at all. So he appeared to them in their sleep and their dreams and said, do not tell Herod where Jesus is because he's going to kill him. That's what's going to happen. He's not going to try to worship him. So they went a different way home because they didn't want to run into Herod. After the wise men were gone, an angel appeared to Mary's husband, Joseph, in a dream. The angel said, take Jesus and Mary to Egypt and stay there. King Herod is looking for Jesus and wants to kill him. 
So in the middle of the night, Joseph got up and took Mary and Jesus to Egypt where they would be safe. A while later, after Herod had died, an angel spoke to Joseph again in a dream. Take Jesus and Mary to the land of Israel because King Herod is dead now. Joseph did what the angel said. He got up and took Mary and Jesus to Israel. The wise men came to worship Jesus as king. God promised, which is what we've been talking about this whole time, to send a king who would be king forever. Jesus is the king who will always be king. Jesus is the true king. And you know what? He deserves all of our worship, okay? There are so many ways to worship him. Um, reading your Bible, praying, living out what he wants us to do, right? Which is helping other people, um, being kind. There's all these things that we're to do um, to worship Jesus. So I hope whatever those things are for you, um, or maybe you need to pray about some other things that you should be doing, um, but just making sure that we're worshiping Jesus, the one true king who, as God promised, um, sent him, right, to be born, to rescue us from our sins. So I appreciate you Metro kids, and I hope you have a great, happy new year, and I will talk to you soon. Bye.